So, I survived a thousand days in hardcore Minecraft again. I thought the best way to share this story was to make a long movie about it, because a lot has happened. If I can't bounce back from losing my old world, my career is pretty much over. So the goal for this world is to make it better than the last. Enjoy the movie. Unfortunately, this story starts with an ending, not a beginning. You see, I had a pretty long hardcore world. I got well over 6,000 days. And I built a ton of really cool stuff that I was very proud of. But one day, I just messed up. And just like that, I didn't have a hardcore world anymore. All of a sudden, I found myself clicking a button that I really wasn't expecting to click. Starting over felt really weird. Here I was with nothing in my hotbar, stuck in a frozen ravine. For a second, I thought I was actually stuck in there. But then I saw some dirt I could reach, so I towered up and discovered I had spawned in a village. That's how you wish your hardcore world starts, right? A bunch of hay bales and food for days. Well, unfortunately, these guys are really poor, so that's not happening. Okay, first things first, I need some wood. Look at this, guys. There's this deep cave right here. That's going to have all the resources we need to get started. But I don't think I'm ready to go in there quite yet. Maybe there's some iron in here to get me started. Well, that can wait. I need some food first. All right, we got that out of the way. Now I need some iron. Your first bit of iron should always be a shield to make sure you don't get blown up by a creep. Oh my god, that, that could have been it right there. I better look around before I start smelting stuff. Well, at least I got some armor and a bucket now. I think it's time to go down into the cave. But these are not the caves I grew up with. Remember this, guys? Yeah, we're going to need a different approach for this one. That's not the way to go. So I made a staircase down to safely get into the cave. And even though it's just the second day, I found quite a few diamonds down there. And then a giant lava lake. Back in my old world, the nether had been incredibly scary at first. But over time, as I got better in the game, I became more confident and it wasn't as scary later on. So I decided to take a look and see what we had to work with here. Okay, this sucks. And closed ravines are not what you hope for when you go into the nether. Anyway, I have to go out of here because I'm out of food. So I made my way up and spent the entire rest of day one out hunting and gathering sugarcane. While I was out there, I had found myself a dog. So I took my new puppy Luna, we hopped in a boat, and we made our way back home. I had only found a little bit of food, but it was turning to nighttime, and I didn't want to be out there. So I went back down into the cave to see if I could find more diamonds during the night. When day two came around, I decided to explore my world a bit more, because I needed more food, and maybe I could find a village with hay bales that would have us covered. At this point in time, as I was making my way around, I realized how cool the area around my spawn actually looked. But really, look at these villages here. This is some of the most amazing Minecraft terrain I've ever seen, and it would have a massive impact on what my world will look like by the end of the video. But we'll get back to that. As I was out exploring, I found a couple of ruined portals. These gold blocks are going to be very useful. We'll need to trade for a fire resistance potion in the nether. By the end of day two, I decided there was no point in waiting any longer. I had semi-decent armor, I had gold for trades, and I had enough food. It was time to go into the nether. I would really like to have an ender pearl for extra security right now. Nice, we're two for two. That could come in really handy. Okay, now we need to look for some open terrain because I'm still stuck here. So I bridged my way out of the nether ravine and dropped down into a warped forest. Now, as cool as these shaders look, I decided to turn them off for safety here because the nether felt really scary. And then, as I looked around, I spotted one of the supporting pillars of a fortress. That was actually kind of a relief because the sooner we can get out of here, the better. If this piglin can trade us for fire res potion, we can safely get the blaze rods and immediately leave. Okay, perfect. Let's drink that up and tower up there. As I made my way up, I realized I had gotten super lucky here. There was a blaze spawner right on the top. So I dig through the wall and then I see it's not one, but two blaze spawners. The thing is, I didn't know that as I made my way up there. And even with the fire resistance, this got a little sketchy. There were about seven blazes right on top of me, and if there had been even a single wither skeleton as well, 
could have been in real trouble. The moment I realized that, I sealed off all the exits and a minute later, I made my way back down with 10 blaze rods. That seems like a victory, but less than 48 hours before this moment, I wasn't worried in the slightest when I was in the nether. But right now, things were very different. I was literally shaking at the thought that I could have messed it up here, because I jumped into the blaze fight unaware of my surroundings. I just wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible, so I ran to the closest rune portal I could find and got back to the overworld. Now this is where our story begins to differ from any Minecraft journey you've ever seen before, because right now, I am lost. Not just because I'm in a cave and I don't know where my base is, that's easy. Just build up to the surface and we're back on track. The thing is, when I started this world, I made a deal with myself. I was going to make the game as interesting as I possibly could. But that challenge came with a few rules that I'll explain later in the video. But right here, we just ran into one of the main ones. You see, I'm never using F3 in this world. The reason behind it is actually quite simple. My journey from here to my spawn would be a straight line if I used coordinates. Actually, every journey ever becomes a straight line. Now, that's super convenient if you want to get somewhere quick, but it kills a sense of adventure. I can hear you thinking right now, Looney, that's just goofy. You know what? Maybe you're right. But for now, just go with it. We are going to share a couple of crazy adventures during this first thousand days that only happened because I don't use coordinates. Anyway, I have no idea where to go right now. The only thing I know for sure is that it can be very far, because the portal I used to exit must have been within about 60 to 80 blocks of the portal through which I entered the nether in the first place. Still, one block in the nether equals 8 blocks in the overworld. I could be up to 640 blocks away from my home. And the only way I get back there is by recognizing the terrain around me. So on the night of day 3, I start an adventure. I climbed down the mountainside, turned my shaders back on, and started looking for clues. Now, I had a general sense of which direction I had to go in. Back when I went out to gather food and sugar cane, I had seen a lot of frozen rivers around this area, and I had followed them all the way to the ocean. I just had to get to the rivers, and then follow them upstream until I ran into a landmark I recognized. And sure enough, it took me a couple of minutes, but eventually I ran into a split in the river that felt familiar. As I boated up the river, I found some XP orbs left behind from my food run, and from there, I knew where to go. By the morning of day 4, I made it back without pressing F3. As I got back home, I realized I was still processing the scare I'd gotten in the nether. I felt shaky, and even though it's quite easy to get ender pearls in the nether, I decided to go the safe route and trade with villagers for pearls in the overworld. As I got a ton of logs, made those into planks, then sticks, and traded for emeralds, I realized that I needed another villager. So I went on a journey into the villages I saw earlier. Turns out, those were on the way to the stronghold. So when I threw my first eye of ender, the next day, I only had to travel a few minutes before I found the stronghold location. I dug into the stronghold through the ceiling of one of the libraries and very carefully navigated my way through the narrow corridors. On the afternoon of day five, I stepped through the portal to fight the Ender Dragon for the first time on this new world. An event that's always scary because this fight is Hardcore's big filter. This is where you're most likely to lose it. And I still carry the jitters of losing my previous world less than 72 hours ago. So the first thing I did when I entered the end was turn my shaders off and go full focus. Before going into the fight, I decided that it was more fun to do the full fight than one cycle the dragon with bats. This fight is now a few months ago, but I remember it so well. My aim was awful on the first shots. The nerves were real, but once I started hitting the shots, it got a little better. I was going to come out of here alive. There was just no other option in my mind. My mindset was fully locked in on slow and steady wins the race. So once hour at a time, I shot down the crystals. The first time the dragon purged on their nest, I realized it too late, and I didn't make it to the center of the island in time. The second time, I was ready and waiting. But so were a bunch of Endermen. The whole situation felt very sketchy and I didn't do a lot of damage on that first rotation. To make things worse, this Enderman ran into my line of sight and for a moment I thought I might be in trouble. Still in the panic mindset of a few days prior, I decided on an awful solution by running all the way out to the very edge of the end island. To make sure the Enderman couldn't hit me, put down a water bucket and I tried to kill him with my axe. I hit nothing but air. And then the dragon shot a fireball my way, so I had to run for it without my water. 
finally, I made the right decision and I fought back. The Enderman turned out to be really low already, so one hit did it and I realized I should have just fought him right away. For the second time in a few days, I could have lost my hardcore world to trying to escape instead of fighting back. I wasn't playing like myself right now. I was scared and scarred from losing my world and it would take me a while to recover from it. As for this fight though, from there it was just a dragon and me. Two purchases later, her health was completely drained and I was standing in the end portal as the credits started rolling. I see the player you mean. Looney? Yes. I felt that. This is one of the most emotional moments I've ever experienced while playing a video game. I had lost something that I worked on for two years, just a few days prior. And now, because I beat the Ender Dragon, I was on the brink of a new adventure. And this time it felt different. It felt like I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew what I was in for this time around. Or at least that's what I thought. But I hadn't realized that I lost a part of myself along with the world. It would take me a while to figure that out. But for now, this was definitely a victory. I had survived a very nervous fight and I was on my way to get an Elytra. A point in the game that I've often described as the moment where everything changes and the world really begins. With that fight out of the way, I towered up to the gateway that had opened up, made sure I had all the necessary resources, placed the trapdoor and squeezed through the narrow gap to make my way into the outer end regions. Straight away, there was a tiny end city to my left, but to get there I had to bridge over the void and I could see there was no end ship at the city, which meant no Elytra. So I decided to run off in a different direction, hoping that the terrain would be easier. Unfortunately, I got to the end of the big island I was on eventually and there was no better option than bridging over the void. Back when I did this in my first world, I remember my pinky finger cramping up from pressing down on shift. This time around, I decided to go for crouch toggle. I had plenty of blocks with me, as well as my diamond pickaxe in case I started to run out of blocks, so I should be fine. As I started bridging, I almost forgot something. I quickly ran back and grabbed some chorus fruit. This can work as an emergency failsafe in case I fall down. If you eat a chorus fruit, it will teleport you on top of any block within reach. And that means you stop falling. So I pressed my crouch button and started bridging. When I got to the other side, there was plenty of area to run again until I got to another bridge. I was moving through the end much faster than I was in season one though. So after about 10 more minutes of hopping through the end, I finally saw a structure appear. The thing is, this end city was exactly as small as the first one I spotted. Since I had to bridge over there anyway, I decided to kill the shulkers before moving on. Quick pro tip, if you start floating, use a water bucket to negate the levitation effect. It is a game changer while in city raiding. Almost right after I left the tiny city, I saw another one rendering in on the horizon. And sure enough, this one had a ship. My mindset was still very much safety first, so I quickly mined some endstone to have a few extra blocks on hand and then I got ready to say goodbye to the early game as I made my way over to the city. Since I had chorus fruit in my hotbar to teleport myself to the ground if I really needed to, I was safe to tower straight up. If you approach from the front side of the end ship, you'll be out of detection range for the shulkers until you're well on the boat. So I made my way up, ran in over the dragon head, immediately rushed down the stairs and after killing the shulker that guarded it, I picked up my first set of wings. Just like that, I was ready to fly my way into the mid game, although that's a debatable term, but we'll discuss that later. As is tradition, I climbed the ladder to the crow's nest and right there and then, I opened up my elytra for the first time. This moment right here is the biggest game changer in starting a long-term survival world. Once you get your elytra, the world is yours. Now the next step is getting plenty of diamond gear and a few more elytra so we won't run out of durability for a while. Once you have enchanted diamond armor, the shulkers don't do all that much damage anymore. But with this mixed bag of diamond, iron and my gold feather falling boots, they are quite annoying. So I chose to raid the chest by digging a hole in the wall while I ignored the shulkers for the time being. This moment always worries me a little bit. Flying deeper into the end looking for that second elytra, there's always the threat of running out of durability. But in the next cluster of end cities, I found my second ship and from there it was smooth sailing. I made my way out of the end 
with a bunch of elytras, a ton of diamond armor and tools, and we were ready to move on to the next stage. Before we do that though, I have to be honest, at this point, everything was feeling way scarier than it did only a few days before. I was clearly shaken up by losing my whole world. Getting past the first dragon fight and finding my elytra did help, but I wasn't feeling like myself right now. Well, at least I could fly around. And I was really looking forward to exploring my world, but there were a couple of things that needed to happen first. The very first thing I needed was an enderman farm to help me max out my enchantments and eventually repair my elytras once I got access to mending. Most components for the enderman farm are really easy to get. All you need is some building blocks, leaves, trapdoors, rails and a minecart. But then there's one thing that can be a little tricky early on. You see, the way an enderman farm works is you make a platform for them to spawn on. Then a drop shoot where they fall down and take fall damage to get them low, you eliminate all the other spawning spots. And then to lure them down, you need an endermite, just out of reach. The one issue is that this little guy will despawn. So to prevent that, we need a name tag. Now, there are three ways I can think of to get us one of those. First, you can get them as a master level librarian trait, but that's too much work. You can get them from chests and minecart chests if you explore structures, but I don't feel like doing that right now. And then you can get them from fishing. This is probably the one time we'll be doing this, but let's go. So I enchanted a fishing rod with luck of the C3 and got to fishing. I started in this river next to the stronghold, but then somebody in stream chat said that the loot tables at sea are actually better. So I took the lily pad out, already caught, and went off to this ocean biome, which looks like a lake, but it has kelp, so it's definitely an ocean. I don't know for sure if the loot tables were better, but a few minutes later we had the name tag. So I made my way back over to the end and built up the farm around 130 blocks away from the end island. As long as you're more than 128 blocks away, there's no spots for the enderman to spawn apart from the spawning platform, which will make sure you get maximum raids as long as the platform is big enough. So how big is that? I have no clue, honestly. But I believe mine goes 14 blocks out from the center and it does the job perfectly. With the farm done, I had plenty of XP, so I got my enchantments for my gear completely sorted, with a little help from this guy who provided the mending books. So let's see, my gear is looking good and I have an Elytra to fly around with. That just leaves one thing to take care of before I can start making this world mine. We are going to run out of rockets pretty soon, so that means we need a way to get plenty of sugarcane and gunpowder to prevent that from happening. It's time to add two more simple farms. But there's one issue right now. I haven't explored my world yet, which means I have no idea where I'm going to build my base. And that means that I don't know where any of the farms are going to go. You see, I just lost a hardcore world that I had for a long time. And there's a big difference between now and when I first started that world. I know how I like to play this game now. So all the things I have to do again, I can do them better now. Honestly, I have a pretty simple philosophy. Some things I don't like are messy terrain from gathering resources, farms everywhere and ugly industrial zones. And some things I do like are lots of resources to build with, farms to get all those resources and a central spot where I collect all that stuff. Hmm. It appears that I want what I can't have. So what do we do now? The solution I came up with was building a temporary mob farm, something that we can remove later. I put a simple sugar game farm up above that farm so we had everything in one place and with that we had everything required to fly around and look for a future base location. This moment felt awesome. With these farms done I had the feeling that I had a hardcore world again. I just needed to find a base location. Because let's face it, this world is full of possibilities right now. But it is also pretty much empty. That feeling of an empty world would soon change because I was about to build my favorite starter house that I have ever made. Before we start exploring though, we need to talk about not using F3 a bit more, because a lot of the choices I'll be making in this video have something to do with not having access to all that information on the debug screen. The most important things are probably coordinates, game days, light levels, entity count, and then there's some more advanced ones like chunk coordinates and the C counter that nobody really looks at except for scientists and speedrunners. We'll struggle with all of these things at one point or another, but right now the most relevant thing for us is the coordinates. Because I have no idea where I am right now. The only way I can understand my world is by knowing where things are in relation to other things. That may sound a little complicated, 
but it's actually pretty cool. The thing is, not having access to coordinates forces me to create a mental map of my world, and that means I have to pay attention. You know what else is really cool? Later in this video, we're still going to figure out some coordinates without using F3, because eventually we need to link up nether portals for travel and farms. It turns out there's almost nothing you can't figure out in this game without using that F3 screen, but that's for later. Let's start flying around the world to see what we can find. I just need a way to find my way back if I get lost. Now, there's a few ways we could do that. The most obvious one, if we make a compass, that will always point back to world spawn. For now, that's good enough. We just have to make sure we stay relatively close to spawn. If I keep everything closer together, I have a much better chance of learning my way around the world. I'm not really sure what we're looking for right now, because there are a ton of potential cool spots to build a base. I do have a few candidates though, and I just found one of them. This swamp is not too far away from my world spawn, and it has a few witch huts. Now, I have always wanted to build a witch farm, so it might be a good idea to keep this place in mind for a base location. As I flew around a bit more, there were some other really cool spots I found. I found this crazy mountain really close to where the stronghold portal is. And then this mountain range, which is unlike anything I've ever seen, as it is situated in an ice spikes biome. This one is located between the swamp and my world spawn. Now, both of these were much less practical, but they offered so much potential in terms of terrain. Just to make sure I wasn't missing out on anything, I flew back to the swamp to take another look, and my decision to not use coordinates gave me its first real present. Since I didn't know exactly where to go, I flew in the general direction that I remembered the swamp to be in. As I made my way over there, I accidentally drifted a little bit too much to the right while flying, and that put this crazy rock right in my path. This is surely the biggest floating rock that I've ever found in a survival world. Minecraft generation is just so weird, this thing shouldn't exist. But you know what? I can see a really cool starter house on there. So I think it's time for our first real project. One of my biggest regrets in my old world was not taking the time to build a starter house that I enjoyed coming back to. So I knew that this time around, I was going to spend as much time as it would take to get this right. The very first step was building a framework on top so I could get an idea of the proportions of the house. Getting proportions right is the key to making any build work. If you get nothing else right except for the proportions of the individual parts, a lot of the time, things still end up looking pretty nice. With the frame on top done, I flew out and I realized how small I was going to have to build. Now the problem with that is that it makes it really tricky to make the house feel cool while also managing to fit in all the things I'm going to need here. Then all of a sudden, I had a great idea. What if we use all the potential space inside of that rock? There's plenty of room to fit a whole house in there. So I started mining out as many blocks as I could to create space until I heard a sound that I wasn't expecting. Against all odds, a zombie villager had spawned up here while I was preparing to build the house. This guy spawning all the way up here was an awesome moment of inspiration. If this moment didn't happen, I think there would have been a very slim chance that I ever got villagers up to the house. During the short period that I've had this world, there have been so many of these tiny moments in the game that could have very well been insignificant. But instead, they caused a butterfly effect that leads to something amazing further down the line. There has actually been a moment like that already, which leads to something much, much bigger later on in the video. For now, this guy was secured in the boat for later, so I could continue working on the frame for the house. I decided to add a tower to the top to better balance out the size of the rock without making the structure too bulky. At this point, the structure was about as tall as the rock itself, which made for a nice balanced feel, and I was happy with the frame. I just wanted it to be a little bit crazier, a little more out there. So I tried a few shapes in dirt until I had a roof line in place, which my chat called the witch hat. Now this was the kind of crazy structure that I was looking for, so I was ready to replace the dirt with actual blocks that worked in the pallet. For the roof I added a combination of oak planks and spruce planks, then I put the walls in place and decided where I would leave openings for windows. Sure enough, the house was starting to come together. But when I started filling this section of the roof with stone brick walls, I felt like that wasn't it. It really needed a splash of color to pop. So I quickly built another portal in the basement and I made my way through. 
I'm thinking that netherwort blocks from the crimson forest are probably the perfect fit here. So I grabbed a bunch of those, went back, and as I filled in the witch hat shape on the roof with the bright red netherwort blocks, they actually added a lot of character. Then I added some oak stairs and fences to smooth out the shape, shroom lights and oak trapdoors to make it stand out at night. And that was the outside of the building done for now. It was time to start working on the interior. Now, it ended up taking a while, but soon enough, we had a storage room to work from, an awesome looking entrance with bookshelves, lanterns, iron bars for windows, and even some dark prismarine details. Then I filled in some of the spaces in between, added some flowers inside of the house and outside. Now that both the interior and a lot of the outside details were done, there was really only one thing left that needed to be addressed. The house itself was looking good, but it wasn't connected to the mountain underneath. So exactly as I had promised myself, I took some extra time to really finish it up. I made a floating crystal out of glass, magma, nether quartz, ore, crimson wood and other red blocks, surrounded by twisting dirt roots with glowberries. All in all, I really love how this place turned out. This is the sort of place I'll definitely enjoy coming back to. But hang on, wait a second. Didn't I say dark prismarine details earlier? Can't you only get that from ocean monuments? absolutely true. So let's go back in time a little bit to before I started working on the interior and I'll tell you how we ended up in an ocean monument. But before we go on that adventure, let's go over my main base project because we're finally ready to start it now. Remember how we accidentally found a location for this house when I was trying to fly back to the swamp biome earlier? Well, I didn't miss it by much. You see, here's the house and here is the swamp. As cool as the house looks right now, it has a pretty big downside as well. After I put in the storage room and the nether portal, there just isn't a lot of space left. There's definitely not enough room to start building farms. And as our world progresses, we'll have an ever-growing need for resources to build big projects. So I want to build a base that is big enough to house all the farms I need without them being out in the open. After exploring most of the area close to my world spawn, I have three locations which I'm considering for the base. There's a shattered Savannah mountain, the Ice Spikes Ridge and the Swamp. Thing is, now that we're ready to start construction, I think it just makes more sense to build the main base around a special type of farm that we can only build in one place. You see, one of the things that I wanted to build in my old world but never got around to was a witch farm. They can generate a ton of resources, but the most interesting ones are redstone and glowstone. And that sounds perfect right now, because one of my main goals for this world is to incorporate more redstone builds. There is of course the issue of swamps not being the most exciting terrain imaginable to build a base in, but I'm sure we'll come up with some sort of creative solution. Now you can actually make these witch farms really easily if you make smart use of the mob spawning mechanics. Let's quickly go over how the farm works. They're based on this unique structure that's called a witch hut. You can only find these in swamps. Now, the huts have an invisible bounding box in which no mobs can spawn except for witches. Thing is, it's not as simple as building a system to collect and kill them. Getting the farm to work is a bit more complicated than that because witches are counted as part of the hostile mob cap. At any given moment, there can only be 70 hostile mobs alive or new ones will stop spawning in. So to make the most of the farm, you want to eliminate every other spawnable space in the area. The most common way people do this is by making an AFK position for their farm high above the ground. Since mobs can only spawn 128 blocks away from the player, and these are the only spots within that range, you'll get the maximum amount of witches spawning in. Unfortunately, that solution is not going to work for us. You see, I like the idea of having as much content for you guys in these videos as I can possibly get. And to do that, I don't sleep in the world to skip game time and I don't AFK at any of my farms. So if we can't just stand on a platform high up in the air, then how do we make sure we don't fill the entire mob cap with other mobs than witches? The answer is straightforward. The rules for hostile mob spawning in Minecraft are really simple. If a full block has light level zero, a mob will eventually spawn on there. Now, at any given moment in time, there are always a lot of blocks that meet that spawn condition in a standard survival world. Which is why you always find mobs in caves. It's always dark down there. So the AFK platform up high works because the player is too far away from every full block with light level zero in the world, except for the ones in the farm. Now we want our farm to work all the time while we're moving around in the area. There's two ways to do just that. 
The first one is to make sure that all the blocks are lit up, because if there's light everywhere, then there aren't any blocks with light level zero. The second way is to just make sure there aren't any full blocks at all. Now, that second method is both much easier and <laughs> it's way more fun. So we're going to use a ton of TNT to make what's called a perimeter. An area where all the full blocks are gone, so there's nothing to spawn on. Now, on a technical level, a perimeter is really cool, but at the same time, it does present us with another issue. Remember when I called the swamp ugly terrain? Now, a massive crater of exploded terrain clearly isn't better, but I'll make a promise. Before the end of the video, this place is going to look much better than it does right now, even though we're going to destroy it first. So let's start figuring out how we're going to pull that off. A straightforward option would be to take the witch hut as the center for our project putting the farm in reach for spawns wherever we are in our base. That's not what we're going to do here though, because we're actually in a very special location. The fact that I've been able to find this is literally insane, especially without knowing my seat or using F3, because that made me stay really close to world spawn while looking for my base. What's so crazy about this is the fact that there's not just one witch hut here, but there's actually two of them about 200 blocks away from each other. And that means there's an area in the middle between them where both farms will be in range, which means double the resources. This is going to take some serious planning. Honestly, this place looks a little intimidating right now. There's so many things that are in the way of starting construction. Plus, it's really hard to design projects which are super big. You see, here's the problem. When you're working on a really big project and you're standing on floor level, you can only see a tiny part of the entire thing. So close up, it's really easy to lose track of the bigger picture. So I need to find a way to know if I'm inside of the actual project area without having to fly up and confirm all the time. Usually, a circle of temporary blocks would do it, but these swamp items are really hard to navigate. Luckily, I came up with a crazy solution for this issue and the best thing about it, after this first small step, the place is already going to look like a crazy project. To build the outline for it, I'm going to need a lot of dirt for temporary blocks. So if we take this block as the center and then build an outline around it with a diameter of roughly 300 blocks, everything should work out fine with the witch bonds. Because it's so hard to walk around down below, I'm probably better off building this reference line up in the air. So I towered up and I started building a circle. But I got the count wrong, and then I got the count wrong again. As I was streaming, I decided this was probably a good moment to take a step back and have a quick coffee break. So I get a cup of coffee, I walk up on my balcony, and I take a moment to think what I actually want to do with this project. Because I started my outline for the perimeter, but I wasn't sure what the base was going to be like at all. And then I thought about everything I'd seen in this world so far, and I immediately knew what I wanted to do. One small moment of inspiration early on had caused the butterfly effect. As I came back from my break, I decided to solve two problems in one go. With the project that I had in mind now, a perfect circle actually wasn't going to make any sense. An organic outline would work much better. That meant I also didn't have to count anymore. Although I still had to pay attention to make sure the new shape roughly resembled the 300 diameter circle. About 20 minutes later, I had made my way around the entire outline. Okay, that's nice, but it's still not great. I want to be able to easily see whether I'm in the project area and looking up isn't exactly ideal. But this is where my crazy idea I had earlier comes into play. The only thing I need right now is a quick way to move this outline down to the ground and I have just a way to do it. Ah, uh, that's not it. If we put a bunch of ice blocks on top of the dirt though and then break it, the ice will melt and convert into a curtain of water that perfectly marks out the entire project area. This is one of the most satisfying things I've ever seen, but we're still a long way off from having a base. At least I have a plan figured out at this point. Let's quickly go over it. So this is the outline I've built around the area. Once I remove all the terrain inside this area, I have a ton of space to build up my farms. Remember how I said I didn't like farms out in the open? Well, that's why we're going to cover this hole with a massive mountain covering everything up. My main base will be on the mountain and the farms will be underneath. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, let me tell you, this will turn out to be way more challenging than I thought, but that's a worry for later. Right now, I was at the point where my world was starting to fill in. 
I had most of my essential gear. I had a cool starter house. I had an outline for my Mega Base project. And with all of that progress, I started to feel like this world was on its way to becoming special in its own right. It wasn't quite as cool as the other one yet, but I could feel the potential of the world and that honestly was an amazing feeling. So now that everything was starting to take shape, I felt this was the time to go on a series of adventures to gather important things that were still missing. The first item on that list was getting netherite armor. I had held off on this for quite a while, but now that I had both my essential gear and my starter house, it was time to max out. Now the quickest way I know how to get ancient debris is by TNT mining. I had a little bit of spare gunpowder from my mob farm that I had built for the firework rockets earlier. So the only thing needed to make TNT was a bunch of sand. To gather that, I flew to a nearby desert that I had seen earlier and I started violently swinging my shovel around. To make the most of the trip, I filled up about 5 shulker boxes and took them to the mob farm to craft up the TNT there. It wasn't a ton, but with nearly 3 stacks of TNT, I made my way back to the house to get into the nether and start looking for netherite. Before I made my way through the portal though, I wanted to take fire resistance potions into the nether. Thing is, the two potions that I got from the piglin way back were long gone now, and because the blaze spawners were located right where I had entered the fortress, I hadn't made my way into the fortress at all, so I didn't have any nether wards yet. I decided now was probably the moment to get that as well. So I took a brewing stand and water bottles with me, put my golden helmet with fire resistance on to protect against piglins and fire damage, and as prepared as I could be, at this moment I went into the nether to get blaze rods and nether wards from the fortress. So I made my way through the portal, but as I flew up on the fortress, I realized I was more nervous than I had expected. Carefully I made my way through, and I actually got everything I needed pretty easily. You know, my gear was pretty strong, but my confidence was still shaken up. And that made me extremely careful about every step I took. Which actually meant that I got nowhere close to any tricky situations. A few minutes later, I had collected all the resources I needed for the potions. So I found a place where I could mine a staircase down to ancient debris level. And as I made my way down, I made my potions right there on the spot. With those in my inventory, there wasn't a lot that could go wrong. So I started mining for the TNT. Now normally, the strategy for TNT mining consists of two steps. First, you mine down to Y13 to Y15, and then you find a chunk border using F3 plus G. But both of those steps involve using F3 in a way that I didn't want to. So I had a little extra challenge to deal with. To find Y13, I had to mine all the way down to bedrock, which starts on Y4, and then climb 9 blocks up again. That was easy enough. As for the junk borders, I could have found those using a map. But I was honestly quite alright with having slightly lower ancient debris rates instead. I honestly didn't need that much. So once I knew where Y13 was, it was as simple as digging a two high tunnel, filling it with TNT, shooting the first one in the line, and hoping for the best. 25 minutes later, I made my way home with 23 ancient debris, which meant I had enough for my armor set and my sword. For now, that would do nicely. That just left three more things to tackle. Next up on my list, I needed to get three wither skeleton skulls to get a beacon. So I made my way back to the nether fortress to hunt for skulls. And the luck I got here was absolutely ridiculous. With looting three, you're expected to get one wither skull on average per 20 wither skeletons killed as they have a 5% drop rate. That makes it pretty wild that I got all three skulls in a total of 11 kills. As me and my stream chat freaked out over my luck, I flew back to my portal and got back to the overworld to fight the wither on a stone mountain close to my house. As I was getting ready for this fight, I remembered how the first Wither fight had been the single most terrifying event on my Season 1 Hardcore World, so I wanted to make absolutely sure I was ready here. As I was checking my inventory, the event almost got cancelled by this creeper wanting to blow up me and the Wither Skulls, but I spotted him just in time, so I quickly handled the interruption and then I placed the third skull. As the Wither was spawning in, I felt a little nervous, but the fight was different than the first time I fought it in Season 1 in every imaginable way. It was over before it had properly started, and there was another major milestone crossed off our list. Next up, I just needed blocks for my beacon pyramid. But this one was a little more challenging. You see, beacon blocks can be iron, gold, diamond, emerald, or netherite. The problem is, I don't have farms ready of these just yet, but I do have some resources from the end city looting I did earlier on. 
Still, that didn't get us anywhere close. But there is one way we can easily get all the resources needed. Since the 1.18 update, you can find iron ore veins deep underground. They're a mix of deep slate, deep slate iron ore and tough. If you're lucky enough to find one and you have a Fortune 3 pickaxe, you can easily mine a full beacon pyramid out of a single vein. Luckily, I had already spotted one of those veins in the dripstone cave over at spawn. So I made my way back there and looked for the vein in the cave. When I found it, I decided to set up a level 1 haste beacon to help me mine it. I just needed to make sure that the beacon beam could actually reach the surface, so I dug up and then mined my way back down. As I made my way to the bottom, I realized I still needed the 9 resource blocks to power the beacon. Luckily, there were some still laying around in my spawn cave from the end rating earlier. So I get ready to fly out of the cave, but I realize that if I place a water bucket at the bottom and then fly out of here, I can drop back in once we have the blocks. So I fly out of the cave, I put a marker up on the tree to make sure I can find this spot again, and I fly to my spawn cave. I shuffle through the shulkers, looking for the blocks that I need, and then I find them in this barrel over here. Now let's pause for a second, guys. I'm about 30 seconds away from dying and losing the world right here, and I have no way of knowing that's the case. Let's see what happens. So I leave the cave, I fly to the river, and I refill my water. From there, I take off, I fly to the marked tower, and I look down that hole to the cave where I'm gonna mine the iron vein. Now, I have no idea why, but in this moment, I'm so sketched out of the idea of jumping down there, that instead I place the water on the top and gently float it all the way down, to find out at the bottom that my original water source has turned to ice. I have never seen that happen underground, but if I had jumped, this would have been the end of the world, which is absolutely crazy to think about. You know what's even crazier? The world was still about to end two days later on stream, in the craziest way you could ever imagine. But before we get to that, let's finish this beacon mining trip. Mining out the ore vein wasn't very eventful, but I will say this, it was really enjoyable. In about 40 minutes of mining with my fortune pickaxe, I had a beacon pyramid worth of iron and I made my way out back to the swamp. That just left one more adventure before we get to the craziest story that will ever happen in this world. I would even take it a step further and say that it's probably the craziest thing that will ever happen to me in Minecraft. But first, we had one last thing on the list. You see, there's a problem here. A beacon is great and all, but I don't think we want to mine out this perimeter. You see, this shape probably has a slightly bigger surface area than a 300 block diameter circle, but let's use that number anyway. If a square is 300 by 300 blocks, that is 90,000 blocks total. A circle covers 78.1% of that surface, but that's only one layer. The lowest layer of the swamp is on Y level 62, and we have to clear it out all the way to Y level minus 59. 121 layers further down. Now, if we assume that 10% of all that space down below is occupied by caves, that leaves roughly 7,654,581 584,581 blocks to be removed. I think it's literally impossible to do all of that by hand, so we need a better solution. We still need to use the beacon to remove these mountains because they're in the way of the solution I have in mind. To destroy the biome, I'm going to use some awesome machines that drop infinite amounts of TNT out of the sky. I activated so many of these things at the same time that it made my 3080 RTX graphics card crash. You definitely want to see how that happened, it was pretty insane. Now, there's one thing I didn't consider yet. Dropping TNT on your Minecraft world is the best way to clear a huge area like this, but there's something that can stop these bombers from doing their job. Water or lava buckets protect blocks from TNT explosions. That means this swamp is probably the hardest biome to clear out using TNT, because there is literally water everywhere. That doesn't just apply to the surface of the biome either, there's a bunch of deep underwater ravines hidden underneath. Now, I can get rid of all that water by replacing it with blocks, but these areas are just too big for one person to fill, so I need a different solution. Luckily, there is one way to remove massive amounts of water. If I can just get my hand on sponges, I can use those to solve my problem. There's only one place in the game where you can find those though. That's inside of the Ocean Monument. If you're lucky. And so, it was finally time to go raid right the monument. I brewed up a bunch of water breathing potions, found a cow on the edge of the swamp to get buckets of milk, and then I flew my way back over to spawn with my diamond sharpened sword instead of the usual smite sword, which was now netherite. I had seen a few ocean monuments earlier, and from my spawn chunks, I knew where to find them. So I flew out to the ocean and I started looking for monuments. Having done this many times before, I drank my potion midair and changed my elytra for my chest plate to drop right into the entrance of the monument. 
There's always the potential for tricky situations when you're inside of ocean monuments, but it's also quite easy to avoid them. As long as you break line of sight with the Guardians, you're honestly going to be fine. So finding this first Elder Guardian, I did exactly that. Hit it once, then swim behind a pillar to break line of sight, and hit it again. In this first room, this fight actually wasn't too big of a deal, and I didn't really need to take cover, but the second Elder Guardian in this monument was in a room filled with Guardians. Now, if you allow these guys to lock on and charge our beam attacks, you can literally be dead in just a few seconds. So here, it is really important to swim around a pillar after every strike. If you circle a pillar, every guardian in the room will break their line of sight at one point during that rotation. So if you execute this strategy all right, you can kill the elder guardian in a room full of guardians without any problems. Using this strategy, I killed all three elder guardians in the monument and I just had to wait out the mining effect. But soon enough, I could collect the sponges and the gold blocks, and Monument Raid 1 was a success. But I still had plenty of potions left, and there were more spiky fish in the sea. So I flew on to the next monument and kept going. Two monuments later, I had a stack and 47 sponges, and I started making my way home. This was actually the second time I went on a monument run in this world. But the audio recording for the first one was awful. Between the two trips, I had almost three stacks of sponges to work with, which was going to be plenty to get the project done. Right as I flew out of the ocean, a thunderstorm started. This was a perfect moment to collect a few mob heads from charged creepers. And I had come prepared. Even though I didn't have a trident yet, there were lightning rods in my ender chest for this exact scenario. As long as you can keep the creeper close enough to the lightning rods, you can get them struck by lightning, which turns them into charged creepers. And just like that, I added another skeleton head to the collection. The thunderstorm unfortunately didn't last much longer. So after this minor distraction, I flew back to the swamp and I started removing some of the water. But at this moment in time, I was unaware that my world was about to end in the craziest way ever during the same stream. The day before, I had cleared out all of the trees to prepare for today's draining operation, and in a few batches of sponges, we were making solid progress. Every time the sponges were filled up with water, I made a quick trip to the nether to dry them all out, just to repeat the process over and over again. After a little while, we felt like it was time for a quick break. I was making great progress with the world, and now that we were working on the foundation of my first mega project, I felt like it was time to conquer another great challenge. We were going to fight another Ender Dragon. Remember how I defeated the Ender Dragon and it had opened up a gateway to the outer end? Well, it does that every time for the first 20 dragon fights. So to truly complete the End Island, you have to defeat the Ender Dragon not once, but 20 times to collect all of the possible gateways. As I was filling in the world and started to make it mine, I felt like it was time to go and complete the end, one fight at a time. So unsuspecting, I made my way through the end portal, flew to the Enderman farm and started preparing for the end of the world without knowing it. To spawn in the dragon again, you need four end crystals, which are made from a gas tier, an ender eye and seven glass. We had done the second fight out of 20 already, and I had five more of these end crystals in the sugar box. So I grabbed four of them and made my way over to the end island to respawn the dragon. I've done this fight many times before with an elytra and I wasn't worried about it in the slightest. So I placed down all four end crystals on the dragon's nest. Beams of light shoot up into the sky and the dragon starts respawning. One obsidian tower at a time, the end crystals start reappearing as the stage is being set for another ender dragon fight. At this moment in time, I realized that I might want some replay mod footage for this exact video you're watching right now in case I did something really cool during the fight. So I fly towards the gateway we had opened up with the previous fight. I miss the landing, circle around and land on top of it, just as the dragon respawn animation is about to complete. At that moment, I save and quit, reload my game and start a replay mod. The fight is about to start any second, so I charge up my bow, aim at the first crystal, and I wait. But nothing happens. Confused, I let go of the bow, and I take off with my Elytra. As I'm floating around the end island, I notice how quiet it is. This is a really weird situation. Then, all of a sudden, I understand what's happening. We are stuck in the respawn animation. The dragon isn't spawning in. 
At this point, I honestly didn't think much of it. I just started trying to figure out a way to unbreak my broken game. So I shoot an arrow at one of the crystals, and somehow the flame lights the top of the beams on fire. But nothing happens. As I look at what is going on, for just a moment, I'm excited about it. I see all the beams up in the air, and I think of the cool builds we can make with that. But that moment only lasts for a few seconds, before I realize that there is no end portal back to the overworld now. We are locked in this dimension until that portal opens up, so I have to find a way to get it to open. Let's see what happens if I shoot the crystals in the middle. Somehow I'm worried of the combined explosion of four crystals, so I decide to shoot one from miles away. As all four of them explode, I realize that might present us with a way out. What if I craft new ones and restart the respawning animation again? I believe I still had some gas tears in the sugar box where I grabbed the crystals from. So I fly back to the Enderman farm and I start looking at all my sugars. Now, I'm an optimist to a fault, but I will admit, I was worried. This was uncharted terrain, my game was broken, and I knew full well that if I couldn't fix it, we were done. But it wasn't over yet. And if there was anything I had more than enough of, it was time. So I put all of my sugar boxes down and I started going over options. I had gas tears, but no inner eyes. Then I spotted the blaze rods. I was pretty much ready to start celebrating our victory because blaze powder and ender pearls make ender eyes. And in a moment, I somehow thought you needed obsidian to craft the crystals rather than glass. So I realized my mistake and I get slightly more worried because we didn't have glass. We didn't have scent to smelt into glass. And as far as I knew, the color glass from the end cities wouldn't work here. At this point in time, everybody in my chat is trying to help me find solutions. And somebody offers the one size fits all. Hey Looney, did you try turning it off and on again? So I reload the game again. But it doesn't seem to help. Meanwhile, I'm freaking out and so is my chat. Everyone is trying to help, but so far there's no solution inside. Someone has tried crafting crystals with purple glass, which we could get from the end cities, but indeed it doesn't work. There's no way to remove dye from glass either, so that's not an option. You can't light nether portals in the end, so that's not an option either. At this point, I'm frantically going through my sugars to take inventory of all the resources we have available. I have one end crystal left, but no way to make more. I have a ton of cobble deep slate, some redstone, some spruce logs, some iron, some gold, some gunpowder. Now that opens up a lot of possible crafts, but I can't find anything that will do it. I'm losing my mind thinking of solutions. And then a possibility presents itself. In my season one world, I made this room for which we pushed end crystals around with pistons. If we can make a piston, we might be able to move the crystals from the towers back into the middle on the dragon's nest and maybe, just maybe, those will re-trigger the respawn animation. And then, then I realize I don't have any cobblestone. Now you can use cobble deep play to make tools. Does that mean we can use it to make a piston too? We tried, but it turns out you can't. And slowly, I started to feel like I was running out of options to escape. Then I thought of one last thing. What if... I had left some cobblestone behind when I was bridging over the void to get my first elytra. That honestly might be worth checking out. Now I have to be careful because we only have a little over two stacks of firewood rockets in the end and no way to make more of those. So I fly to the gateway and I make my way to the outer end. And sure enough, the bridges are cobble, but they're also made out of slabs, which you can't use to craft a piston either. Hoping against hope, I follow my trail through the end. Maybe there is a small chance that I have dumped a few blocks of cobblestone in a chest to make room for the diamond armor I looted from the end. As I make my way to the end city, I start frantically going through all the chests. But it isn't here. There's no cobblestone. Which means that I can't craft a piston. Which means... No. I wasn't ready to give up on this world at all. But it did seem like we were running out of options. I made my way back to the Enderman farm to check one last time. As I was going through all my shulker boxes, somebody in my chat said there was cobblestone in the shulker box that had all the deep slate. And there was, but we were still one short. One final check of the shulkers. There's, there's just no way. We can't open up the end portal with the things we have in here. With a blank stare, I looked at my shulker boxes. I checked my Discord DMs because people were sending me possible solutions, but none of it worked. 
I tried to make an end crystal with purple glass just to stop people yelling that was the solution. I showed the Priston craft again with the deep slate for the same reason. There was no way. This was it. We were going to have to retire Hardcore Season 2. So what do you do if you lose your Hardcore World to a broken game? Well, you leave it behind in style. If I meant to live in this godforsaken end I mentioned forever because of a broken game, then I'll live here in the best retirement home I can come up with under the circumstances. There's not a lot of materials to work with here, but there's something. So with a bunch of obsidian and stone, purple and some deep slate, a little bit of iron and a tiny bit of spruce, I did the best I could do in a world that apparently just wasn't meant to be mine. And in the end, it looked pretty special. Still though, I have never hated and loved this game at the same time as much as I did in that moment. Or at least, that's what I imagine it would have felt like if things had gone down like this. But this is not how our story ends. As I was about to retire my world, someone had spotted the beginning of the most unlikely of redemption arcs. And because of it, we were about to do the impossible. I had forgotten about this, but the very first time we had entered the end, I'd used four cobblestone to tower my way up the island as I was about to fight the dragon. That cobblestone was still there, and one of the 1400 people watching my stream at the time had just seen it. This didn't mean we were out yet, but it was a glimmer of hope. So I crafted up that single piston and I started very carefully pushing the end crystals around. These crystals that get summoned as part of a respawn animation are what's called invincible end crystals. You can't break them. I actually didn't know that. And in all the craziness of this situation, I hadn't realized that shooting an arrow at them did nothing. So I was very careful as I started pushing the crystals towards the middle, one at a time. This took forever, even though the process got more effective as we went on. Still, it took well over half an hour to bring the crystals down to the dragon's nest, which set us up for the most suspenseful moment ever. Nobody in chat had ever been in a situation, so nobody actually knew if what we were trying was even possible. Neither did I, but we had to try. So I got ready to place that last end crystal, the one that we had left over all this time. Standing there, I was ready to retire the season, but I was also hoping that I didn't have to. And then, I've never lived a more dramatic moment in all my hours playing Minecraft. Please, please, please let it work. But then, there was nothing. Come on, dragon. I couldn't tell if the dragon was really respawning, because the old stuck animation was still in place. I waited, and I waited. Please let it work. And then the dragon spawned in. Yes! Yes, it works! It actually works! We are getting out of the end! We are surviving this! Right at this moment, the world was ours for the taking. And so I took it. I just have to beat the Ender Dragon, and I've done this hundreds of times before. For the final hit, I used the piston that had just saved our entire world. And as the dragon died, our escape to the overworld opened up. This fight had just changed everything. As I respawned in my starter house, I realized that this world was now really, really special to me. I'm never going to have another Minecraft adventure that's quite as epic. So it's up to me to make this world count now. Before I had entered the end earlier that day, I was excited to start a big project. But two hours later, everything felt different. This world had just been lost and recovered because of three simple things. Determination, refusal to give up, and the awesome community of people that I get to share these adventures with. That's you. Because of that experience of losing the world by a fault that wasn't my own, and then recovering it together, I suddenly felt like we were now sharing the most special Minecraft world I'll ever have. And I was determined to make it just that. The first thing I did when we made it out of the end is turn the nether portal room at the house into a museum display to preserve the items that had helped me to save the world. There was of course that one piston that we used to kill the dragon, but also a redstone block and a button that we had used to activate the piston as well as all the stuff that we had used to bridge around the end as we were pushing the crystals down to the dragon nest. This room marks a transition from a new world 
to a special world. But as I flew out of the house, the reality of the situation hit me. It was really cool to see the water wall that marked our future project. And I was even more excited than I previously had been about the double witch farm that we could build here. But the world felt more special than it actually was. So it was time to double down and embrace the grind. We had a swamp to get rid of. Let's quickly recap what we need to do here. I want to get rid of all the blocks in here down to bedrock. So there won't be any places for mobs to spawn except in the witch farms that I will build here and here. There are a few steps that need to be taken care of first though. If we start building flying machines right now, they will run into these mountains and blow themselves up. So before we do anything, I need to flatten these out. Next up, we have to get rid of all that troublesome water that I mentioned earlier. Using the sponges, I went ahead and drained the entire swamp of all the water that I could find. Every time the sponges were filled up with water, I made a quick trip to the nether to dry them all out, just to repeat the process over and over again. Just this small task took me more than 6 hours to complete, and at this point, I worried whether I had taken on too much work. But there was no way back now. Making a monumental base is going to take a monumental effort. With the mountains flattened and all the trees and water removed, the biome was finally ready to be taken apart. But I'm still missing some key components. First off, the main resource needed to build the flying machines is slime blocks. To craft these, you need to kill lots of slimes to obtain slime balls. And there's only two ways to collect those. The first one is quite tricky, but there are chunks in every world where slimes spawn naturally. You can find those using external software like Chunk Base if you put in your world seed. But I haven't checked my seed because I believe a long survival world is more fun if you preserve a sense of adventure. Finding a slime chunk underground can take a lot of time and then we still have to build a farm. Lucky for me, the other option is easy because it's right in front of us. Swamps have the unique feature that slimes can spawn on the surface at night. Since I have just fully cleared all the water, there are a ton of spawnable spaces here. Since I don't sleep in the world at all, there's plenty of time to fly up, force spawns and chop these guys to bits with my looting sword. My motivation was through the roof at this point, and progress came very, very swiftly. We were quickly approaching the point where I was ready to start bombing out the biome. But there's just one thing that we still need to collect before we're ready. The one thing left to find is a coral reef. Using Silk Touch, we can collect the coral fans, which will allow the TNT to drop and stay in the same place at the same time, while the flying machines move back and forth over the swamp. I had seen a warm ocean a little while ago, past the desert where we got all the sand for the TNT earlier. The thing is, I didn't quite remember where it was, and I was having trouble finding it. As I was flying around, I ran into a raiding party though. Naturally, I took these guys out, but I wasn't quite sure if I actually wanted to fight a raid. When I first started the world, I wasn't sure if I ever wanted to have a totem of undying in my inventory at all. But the miracle escape after getting locked in the end had changed my entire perspective. I now wanted to use every resource at my disposal within the game to make the most of this world. I want this to be the Minecraft world that I'll be remembered for. While I was making up my mind about whether or not this was the right moment to get my first totem, I accidentally flew over a village. Well, that meant I didn't have a choice anymore. This raid was happening right now. So I quickly secured some of the villagers inside to make sure they were safe. And then I started taking out the waves of attackers. Since I accidentally started a raid, the timing wasn't very convenient. And as the sun set and more and more hostile mobs started spawning in, I made it my priority to not get too close to the fight. With my elytra, I flew around and picked off the raiders from a safe distance away. Slowly but surely, I cleared all the waves and after successfully claiming victory, I picked up any totems dropped by the evokers. These should at least come in handy to prevent me from dying to fall damage if I ever do something stupid. Although, nah, I can't really see myself doing that. Once I flew out of the village, it turned out it actually wasn't that far from the warm ocean that I had been looking for. Once I found the ocean, I collected all the coral fans I would need using Silk Touch and I flew my way back to the swamp to start building the TNT flying machines. There's a lot of different ways we could set this up, but I chose to go with the simple design of bombers that fly out a single line and then come back. To make that happen, we need bombers on this side and then we need return stations over on this side to send them back. Right, that just leaves the matter of the witch huts now. I want to be able to easily see where these are located after we blow up the entire biome. Now, I think the best way to do that is probably encasing them in an obsidian box. 
Honestly, we don't really need a full box, but I like the idea of unwrapping the huts after we've destroyed everything around them. So I made a quick trip to the end to mine one of the obsidian pillars and get the blocks I needed. I'm coming back here later for more dragon fights, which means the pillars will respawn, but I don't care about that right now. Once I had all the obsidian that I needed, I made my way back to the swamp and prepared the huts. And with that, we were ready to start thinking about explosions. During the days, I started setting up the flying machines while I spent the nights gathering more slime balls. Getting all of them set up took a while as I needed more than 60 flying machines to cover the entire width of the perimeter. But finally, I was ready to send them off. In a moment full of anticipation, I hit the button and nothing happened. I'm confused. These should be working now. Oh, I got it. They're still stuck to the dirt underneath the machines. Let me just remove that quickly. Even just removing the excess dirt took a while because of how many machines we had ready to go. But once all of the dirt was gone, I could finally send them off. As I was running along, pressing the start button on a ton of machines, I could notice my frames dropping. I saw loads of TNT raining down on the biome. Excited, I flew up to get a good view of what was happening. And then I saw a bunch of minecarts dropping down into the swamp. Okay, that's an issue. We need to tweak some settings. Usually, I run the game on a fairly low simulation distance to minimize lag. That's not going to work right now, because if the game unloads the minecarts, they're going to miss a beat and drop down. With higher simulation distance, the flying machines won't end up outside of the area of the world that I'm loading in. So with a little bit of problem solving, I was ready to continue, and I decided that I had to try to activate all the flying machines at once now that they would save. That was a bad idea. I actually crashed my game a good few times during this, even in replay mode after it happened. But you know what guys, it was just too good to keep from you. So I struggled for hours to get you this replay mod montage of the giant bombing of the stone layers. Look at this guys, that's a pretty deep hole. I have run into an issue though. You see how the floor is pretty flat right now? The TNT won't fall any further down before exploding. We have reached the limit of what these bombers can do. Let's quickly clear the water in this last section so we can finish bombing that down first. Often it is just a couple of source blocks that keep messing you up. There, that will do it. Honestly, this was awesome. But as quickly as the TNT shredded through the biome, there was a lot of work left to do. We hadn't even made it all the way through the stone layers. Since the 1.17 update, the world has gotten a lot deeper than it used to be. So once we made it through most of the stone, we were only halfway there. There were another 64 layers of deep slate to blast through. I could have let that discourage me, but I was having a blast with this. I've never seen a Minecraft world change so much in this short of a time frame, and I wasn't about to stop. So I started taking all the flying machines and return stations apart as I moved the entire rig to a lower position. We had to do the same thing once more and I was about to find out that the second run would be a lot more exciting. Before we got started with that second run, I decided that it was probably a good idea to make another temporary mob farm for gunpowder. We're going to spend so much time around this project area and if I fly back and forth through the old farm, we're going to waste a lot of time long term. And honestly, these farms are down before you know it, so I just got it out of the way. We were ready to start setting up the second layer of bombers, but before we did that, I wanted to make my way back to the end again. We still had some unfinished business there. Ever since we had made our way out of the end, I had carried an escape kit with all the possible resources to make my way out of the end if we ever got stuck in there again. Even with everything that happened, I wasn't discouraged from my quest to defeat 20 ender dragons and open up all the gateways. I had defeated a total of 10 dragons by now, but most of the fights had been quite uneventful. Until I remembered that it was possible to lure the ender dragon through the end gateways. Since we knew that we could restart the respawn sequence as long as I had enough end crystals to do it, I wanted to see if I could fight multiple ender dragons at once. So first, we had to lure one out from the end island. The mechanic I intended to use for this is the dragon charging you as she leaves the nest after a perch. After a few tries of me standing up on the gateway, I noticed that it looked like she flew under the gateway every time. 
So I towered up a few blocks to see if that helped. It felt like we got really close that time. But she was still a little bit too low. So I added two more blocks. And sure enough, on the next charge, she flew through the gateway and disappeared. I rushed for the nest as quickly as I possibly could and placed four more end crystals down to try and spawn in a new dragon. But once more, nothing happened. Now this scared me, because this was the only way I knew how to get out of here. So I flew out to the outer end regions in the direction of the gateway the dragon had gone through. I turned up my render distance in the hopes of finding her, and eventually I did. Together we flew back towards the central end island, where the crystals were still in place and nothing was happening. After a moment to consider, I decided I didn't care about fighting multiple ender dragons enough to try this again. I was freaked out and I just wanted to make sure we could get out of the end again. So I started bringing down her health, until all of a sudden there were two dragons. During the fight, I had no idea where the second one had come from. That mystery of the second dragon could only be solved using replay mod. It turned out that we hadn't just found one dragon out in the end. Two dragons followed us back to the island. With this AI being absolutely fried, one of them got stuck under the island until it eventually emerged. We were just minding our own business, fighting a single ender dragon. And then all of a sudden, there were two. My chat went absolutely wild and the dragons collided with each other in mid-air as if two legendary Pokemon were fighting it out in front of our eyes. For about two minutes, it was the most epic fight ever. But apparently, this fight wasn't meant to be. Because one of the Ender Dragons slapped the other one out of existence as they both perched at the same time. Yeah, Ender Dragons are kinda weird. We killed the remaining dragon and with that we had broken the end once more and we had some epic replay mod footage to show for it. That was honestly such a cool adventure. But it was time to get back to work over at the main base. The second layer of bombers wasn't going to build itself. So I flew out of the end and we got to work. Initially I was a bit worried about the deep slate. I had never removed deep slate with TNT so far and since it takes a lot longer to mine, I half expected the blast resistance to be through the roof. Even then, I'm sure the bombers would have made their way through, considering how much TNT they drop. Just to be sure, before I moved everything down, I wanted to do a test run. So I sent the first bomber on his way to clear the deeper layers, while I used that time to remove some leftover floating blocks with the help of a slow falling potion. That made landing on them a lot easier. So I spent the next few minutes flying around and clearing leftover blocks while the TNT bomber ran its test run. And you know what? It destroyed the deep slate just as quickly as it had gone through the stone earlier. This was going to work just fine. And that meant we were ready to start setting up the second level of bombers. Then I got distracted. I decided to quickly take a look in a giant cave that got opened up in one of the side walls. This place just looks super cool. It even has a mine shaft in it. Curiosity got the better of me. So I headed into the mine shaft to take a look. In there, I spotted an exposed block of emerald deep slate ore, which is literally the rarest ore block in the game. In this moment, it was hard to believe that I was about to find something much more valuable. After making my way out of the mineshaft cave, I started taking down the flying machines that I had used to clear the first part of the biome. It's still early days, so I need to recycle these materials to build the new bombers down there. With the first few done, I decided to clear the biome in segments while I took down the rest of the machines. But as these first ones got to work, I thought it would be a cool feeling to just stand on the edge and enjoy the progress for a minute. As I was standing there looking down, I saw something shiny. I spotted some diamond ore. And then some more. And that made me realize we might be able to find enough diamond ore here to build a full diamond beacon. It would be a risky operation though. Getting the diamond ore from down there means we're going to have to fly in between the rain of TNT. And that's incredibly dangerous. I could easily die down there. But a free diamond beacon? I feel like I just can't pass up on it. With a little bit of doubt left in my mind, because of the risk involved, I realized complementary shaders actually make it a lot easier to spot the diamond ores. Which means I don't have to spend nearly as much time down there trying to find them. 
think that decides it, guys. I'm going to try and get a diamond beacon while we get rid of the remaining layers of terrain. But hang on for a second. I'm getting ahead of myself here. We have to move all the bombers down first. The next couple of days were spent hunting for diamond ore as I took down all of the bombers and rebuilt them on lower positions. And as the caves and rock formations that had been hidden under the swamp slowly got shredded to bits around us, the diamond beacon seemed to be in range. And then, with the finish line in sight, I pressed pause on everything we were doing. It was as if I overdosed on the destruction around me. I had never made this big of a mess in Minecraft before, and I had some trouble finding my balance with it. All of a sudden, I felt this overwhelming urge to add something to the world rather than take away from it. I realized that at the beginning of the world, I had imagined that I would live peacefully in this world, appreciative of everything that surrounded me. If you looked at my world right now, that wasn't what this place looked and felt like at all. So I decided to fix something about this mess, even if it was a tiny fix. So I took an hour or so to upgrade what could only be described as my shulker box plateau. Back when we started working on the project, I had made a nether portal here to dry out my sponges while we were removing the water from the swamp. Over time, I had also put down a few sugar boxes with materials up here, but it was a mess. So I decided to do something about it. Starting with an oak log frame around the nether portal, I built up a storage tower to overlook the construction project. Because the hill that it was placed on wasn't all that big, the storage tower was a relatively small build as well. That means it's a little more challenging to keep it from getting blocky and square. Using walls rather than full blocks in between the logs helped a lot to add some depth. In the end, the magic is always in the details though. And as I put a flag on the top, built a spiraling staircase around the mountain and decorated with leaves and copper, the tower started coming to life. As I flew out to take a look at my tower, I felt what is probably best described as relief. At this moment, I should have recognized the signs. But I didn't. It would be a little while longer before I understood what was wrong. With the tower done, I figured it was probably a good idea to check how much progress I had made towards the diamond beacon. So I took all my diamond ore that I had mined up to the top of the mob farm that I had rebuilt here. I towered up 24 blocks to make sure I wasn't too close to generate spawns. I was running fairly low on gunpowder for rockets, so having a couple creepers spawning in would be a welcome bonus while I mined all the diamond ore using Fortune 3. I ended up with an absolute ton of diamonds, which after crafting them into blocks made for a total of 2 stacks and 13 diamond blocks. That meant I was still 23 diamond blocks short. It was going to be a really close call. So I started up the last few machines and paid close attention to the blocks that were being exposed as they flew back and forth. Even though I didn't really care about the diamond beacon when we started, I now took some of the biggest risks that I had taken so far in flying through the TNT. But I didn't get into any real bad spots and by the time that the last bomber came to a halt, I had a bunch more diamond ore. So I flew up to the top of the mob farm once more and mined everything I had collected. 10 minutes later, I was the proud owner of a diamond beacon. Actually, I was the amused owner of a diamond beacon. People have mined for days to get their hands on one of these to show off to their friends. Yet here we were, with a giant crater just like we planned, and a free diamond beacon to go with it. I was feeling on top of the world. But then, as I took a moment to look around, the reality of the situation hit me. This was bad. I had made one of those Minecraft worlds, and I hate. It was all function and no form, all efficiency and no content. All I had accomplished so far was a starter house, a storage tower, and a whole lot of destruction to make sure my farms would perform well. This was not the world I had been dreaming of. Sure, it was a step along the way, but maybe I was trying to go too fast here. Maybe. I needed to take a step back before we took another step forward. According to my plan, the next stage of building the base was to get a snow farm going so I could start working on the mountain that I had in mind to cover this giant hole back up. But right as I was about to set up my snow farm, I remembered something I had seen a long time ago. Just in time too, as this thing we were about to do would put us back on track. Do you remember the three options I had for my base location? We had the shattered savanna, the ice spikes, and the swamp. So out of these three options, 
I had chosen the least interesting terrain and then I made it worse. This is going to take a lot of work to make it right. It is so much smarter to work with the terrain rather than against it, but I had destroyed everything. So what if instead of putting the snow farm in here, where we're surrounded by chaos right now, I put it in a spot where it's naturally going to look cool. And with that thought in mind, I made my way over to the ice spikes biome and I spawned in a snowman. Now the way snow farms work is actually pretty simple. If you have a snow golem in your world, they spawn in snow layers on the ground underneath them. If you aim on that block you're standing on, you can collect those layers with a shovel. Either as snowballs, which you can use to craft snow blocks, or as snow layers if you use silk touch. I would be needing both of those later. But there is a little trick you can use to make this a lot more effective. You see, the snowman can fill up to four blocks with snow layers at one time, as long as they're standing on the edge of the block. So, if you get them to stand on the corner of an elevated slab, you can shovel two layers at the same time by aiming right on the overlapping pixels. This nifty little trick doubles the effectiveness of your farm, with almost no extra work. So we had the farm in place, but then I decided to not go the simple route and just leave this out in the open or enclose it in a small square box. It was time to build rather than destroy, so I took my time to build a cool tower around the snow farm. That started with the frame and the cool thing about it was that I could get the resources right from the farm itself. Eventually I needed more resources to make it look good though. So I went on a little quest to collect the things I need. Now that I had all the resources ready, I could start construction on Chatterson Jr. the fifth's home. This little guy is actually the only thing tying my season 1 world and this world together. Maybe you remember this ice castle, in which three snowmen met their unfortunate demise in the old world. Accidents happen, I guess. But I was going to make sure that history would not repeat itself in this world. At least, that was my intention, but before I even finished building the frame, we were onto Chatterson Jr. the sixth after an unfortunate incident involving a skeleton. Other than that, the construction for the farm went pretty quick. I wanted it to fit with the biome around it and look really cold, so the main building blocks were snow and ice, something that would turn into a bit of a pattern as we progressed. Then I added some warped stems as an accent, which works especially well in complementary shaders. And finally, I added some diorite slabs, stairs and walls to add details and a little bit of texture to the white. Finally, a couple of sea lanterns from the ocean monuments on top made for the perfect finishing touch. That's it. This place actually looks awesome. And that somehow made the mess over at the main base all the more painful. Sure, we were making a ton of progress and I had even set up the first of the witch farms a little while ago. It was a shifting floor design by Il Mango, which detects if there's mobs in the farm and then pushes blocks back and forth. Now, because the soul sand here is slightly lower than the stone, it glitches the witches into the stone blocks, causing them to fall through the floors into the killing chamber. The farm was awesome, but the area as a whole, well, it looked miserable. Looking out over all the destruction, it felt like I might have taken on too big of a project too early on in the world. Maybe it could have helped to get a bit more settled before starting this huge operation. Right now, the situation was simple though. There was nothing to it, but to do it. We needed to seal this hole up as quickly as possible, and it would help a lot if I could come up with a way to find the fun in it. And then, as I stood there, my gaze shifted up, and I knew what to do. It looks like the only cool thing here is a diamond beacon, right? Wrong. Expensive beacons are boring. So in a classic loony operation, I'm going to trade this diamond beacon for an epic snowy mountain. Now I have a small confession, guys. We could clearly just do this with mending shuffles, but it wouldn't be nearly as much fun. The stupidity of trading a diamond beacon for shuffles for a mountain had me super excited to go and work on it. So I'm going to need a ton of enchanted books to get all the required shovels. The best way to get those is definitely librarian villagers. And the perfect spot to keep your important villagers is at your house. Now, this all sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, it's not that simple. You see, stealing villagers away from their homes is a barbaric practice, so we can do that. That means we just need to find a couple of zombie villagers, get them up to the house and cure them up there. There is a bit of a complicating factor though. There's only one way to get them up to my house, and it is a risky mode of transportation. Oh 
Okay, getting them up there is too tricky. So what if we make a platform up above the house and then we can drop them down in a boat? Now, it took a few nights to make the platform big enough and get all the villager spawns that I needed, but eventually we got it. So I had three zombie villagers ready, but then these guys showed up. I quickly got rid of them and then got a bucket of milk because I really don't want to spawn a ravager in my house right now. Okay, it looks like they are ready to go, but it's a pretty steep drop. We could maybe use minecarts or build a ramp for them just to make sure we don't lose any of the villagers. You know what? I really don't want to build a staircase down. This is just gonna work out. This is this is definitely going to work out. Zero problems. There you see, easy. Uh, wait, let me fix this. I'll be honest, guys. I, I actually thought that I killed him, but somehow this worked out. Now I just need to cure them. Overall, things were going really well with the villagers. And this guy offered me unbreaking three for a single emerald. That meant I just needed efficiency four, silk touch, and a way to make plenty of emeralds. After cycling everybody's trades by replacing their workstations, we got all the librarians we needed, plus a mason villager who will buy clay balls. And that is gonna work perfectly, because a little while ago, I found this lush cave nearby. So I think we're ready to start getting our enchanted shovels. And that's when I started a crazy cycle of trading clay for emeralds, emeralds for bookshelves and enchanted books, then flying back and forth to the end to combine books and shovels, emeralds started running out, so I got more clay, then insects, more bookshelves, more books, more emeralds, more trays, more jambas, until finally, I found myself back at the snow farm, in front of shulkers full of enchanted diamond shovels. I was ready for the third step of my loony operation. We had to collect a mountain's worth of snow. And I gotta say, after all the destruction over at the main base, it was quite a relief to be able to get all the blocks that we needed for the next stage without having to shred another biome. So far, I had caused a lot of destruction, but I vowed to repair everything. From the crater in the swamp to the hole in the ground nearby where we had gathered all the dirt for the initial outline. Everything except for the desert where we've been gathering sand earlier. But honestly, I've kept that place looking pretty nice. At least if we compared it with the desert where I'd gathered sand in my previous world. So I told myself that one was quite acceptable. For now, we were shoveling away at the snow farm, which meant our environmental impact was very minimal. Although the farm was great, getting all the blocks crafted up was actually a ton of work. After a few inventories, I'd figured out a way to go about it but I spent a few hours total collecting and crafting up snow blocks before we would finish up the mountain. For now, I was a few diamond shovels down, but I had enough blocks to start building. So the first step to getting this mountain project built up was figuring out the shape. As always, I did that by building up a framework. As I built the first couple of lines, I realized that the mob farm posed a question. I built it out of dirt so we could remove it again later but I wasn't quite ready to get rid of it. And the whole point of having it in this location was that it would generate gunpowder and other resources while we were working in the area. So I think we'll decide on keeping it or getting rid of it altogether later on. For now, I wanted to make progress, so I chose to build the mountain around the farm for the time being. Now I think the best way we can do that is sealing it up in a snow tube and then we can remove the roof overhead. Hmm, I've done the sides, but I just realized it might be smart to leave it open for a bit in case I want to convert it into a creeper farm later. Gunpowder is easily the most useful thing we're getting here. So I had the farm sealed in for the time being and a part of the wireframe done. And that's when I realized that this whole project is going to be a lot more complicated than I thought. We've destroyed all the blocks in the area, which means that the blocks we're placing now are the only spawnable blocks. And you know what happens if there's only a few spawnable blocks in an area? You get a mob party. And I really don't want that. So I should probably get some snow layers to spawn proof this right away. If you use silk touch here, you get snow layers instead of snow walls. Now snow layers are actually really cool. A single snow layer doesn't really do anything, but if you put two or more on top of each other, they will prevent mobs from spawning. So if we cover this line with snow layers, it's safe. Right, the frame is starting to make sense. The farm is doing really well too. Let's remove the roof of the farm because the top of the mountain will provide the shade we need. Okay, so these lines are going all the way to the summit. Hmm, I actually don't know how high up we are right now. I need to know how much room we have to build up further before I decide where the top of the mountain is. 
Since checking my Y level with F3 was no option, I towered up until I couldn't go any further. And as I reached the build limit, I couldn't go any higher up, so I went out to check what it looked like. I really liked what I was seeing. It is a tall mountain, but we still have enough room to build a base up there later. For now, I'm just going to fill in this summit so the mob farm keeps working. And with that, we had a start to our framework. The progress is feeling good, and honestly at this point, I wanted to do nothing except for work on that mountain frame, so we got closer to sealing off this monstrous pit of destruction. But as much as I wanted to keep working on it, I foresaw a bunch of hurdles and bottlenecks in the near future. You see, even though I was struggling with the skill of the project and the mess that I had made, the plan itself wasn't bad. Building all my farms in this area where I was spending so much time to clean up now and will be spending so much time to decorate in the future, it is going to give me all the resources I could dream of for future projects. But for that plan to work, it is important that we build the right farms at the right time. And if I think about what we're going to need for that, there are a couple of resources that we are going to be needing time and time again as we set up our farms. So it's probably smart to start solving some future problems before they smack us in the face. It is time to start thinking about some serious industry. You see, farms need lots of hoppers, and without an iron farm, we won't be able to afford that. So let's see what we need to get an iron farm set up. Essentially, what an iron farm is, is a simulated village. But not just any simulated village, a simulated village with a safety hazard. If villagers think that they're in a village, they will try to protect their village from any threats. But these guys aren't great at combat themselves, so if they feel like they're in danger, this guy comes into the picture. Villagers will spawn an iron golem if they see a threat, and there's no other iron golem in the area. So to farm the iron golems, we need villagers, we need a threat, and we need a way to quickly kill any golems and collect their resources. That all sounds simple enough, so let's start with the first one, we need a few zombie villagers. To find these, I've removed some torches on the bottom of our massive pit of destruction, so hopefully we're going to be able to find a few at night. After we get two, we could breed the villagers, but honestly, there is just something wrong about keeping a bunch of people in a pit waiting to help you. So I chose to do it the hard way. It took me a few nights, but eventually we got enough zombie villagers to start up the farm. I just need to cure them now, but I'm running out of gold for golden apples. Now, at some point we're going to have to build a gold farm, but building a gold farm for me is going to be quite tricky because I don't use F3. So I'll do that a little bit later. For now, I just want to keep going and I know a place where we can easily get a bunch of gold. The problem is, it's a scary place. You know what? We're going there anyway. So I dug into this bastion from the top with the idea that if something happened, I could just fly out through this hole. I made my way down very, very slowly, shot every piglin I saw from a safe distance away until I made it to the gold. And for my efforts, I came away with a sweet bonus of two netherite ingots. Awesome. The trip to the bastion had been scary, but it had been worth it as well. With plenty of gold for golden apples, I brewed up some potions of weakness, cured all the villagers and built up a simple iron farm. I put a zombie in a water source, which makes him bounce up and down. Now, this is something really interesting. It breaks line of sight between the zombie and the villagers. Now, the thing with villagers in Minecraft is that they have a worse short-term memory than your average goldfish, which means that if they don't see a zombie, they forget that they're scared. And this allows them to sleep every now and again for a split second. And as long as these guys all get their power naps, you don't have to worry about your farm breaking. Now I needed a fair bit of iron to set up my next farm, so I let the farm work and I focused my attention back on the mountain as we kept grinding out the progress. I placed a ring of snow blocks all around the mountain and started connecting it to the inner ring to divide the massive project into smaller segments. Slowly but surely, the frame started filling in and it was extremely satisfying to see the progress. Until I realized I was building an accidental mob farm. Remember how I explained that mobs would spawn on full blocks with light level 0? Well, we removed all the blocks in this area that met that condition. But now that I was placing new blocks, these are the only spawnable spots. And that means they will spawn entire armies of mobs. And they did. There's mobs spawning all over my mountain. Um, that's not good. To fix this, I made another trip to the snow farm to break some more shovels as I collected a bunch of shulkers filled with snow layers. 
Replacing all of these took forever, but eventually it fixed our problems. But at the same time, it really didn't. Apparently a project of this skill just keeps throwing more problems at you. Here's the thing, I need to make sure I cover the entire mountain, and a block of snow with or without snow layers looks pretty much the same. So we need a way to clearly mark it. What was that? Oh, you can help me out? Okay, awesome, let's do it. I'm setting up a sheep farm right here up in the air. The location probably looks a bit random right now, but this will start to make sense later on, I'm absolutely certain. Sheep farms are pretty simple. If a sheep gets sheared, it needs to eat grass to regrow its wool, and it will do so within a second, because science. So if we put a sheep in a box on top of a grass block, and an observer looking into that block, we can see if the grass changes to dirt or back to grass. Just make sure that there's another grass block next to that one to spread new grass after it gets eaten. If you put a transparent block on top of that one, it never reverts back to dirt. Now, every time this observer sees a change in the grass block, it will power the block behind it, which powers redstone on top of it, which powers this dispenser that shears in it. And there you go. Put a hopper minecart under that to pick up the wool, and you got yourself a wool farm. With the wool from this farm, we can now mark out which areas of the mountain are already spawn-proofed, but it's going to take a little bit of time before it's ready. To put that time to good use, I built up an automated melon and pumpkin farm right under the sheep farm. This one actually works pretty much the same, but instead it activates pistons to destroy the crops when they grow. The resources from this farm are going to be my main emerald trade for the near future. The wool farm meanwhile hasn't quite stacked up on blocks yet, but I realized that I can use the string from the general mob farm to craft wool in the meantime. Now this is not the most efficient method, but at least we can keep working on the mountain. So I took the wool, marked out an area I had already spawn proof with snow layers, and I felt like I was back on track, until I flew under the mountain. It turned out that there were now a million mobs down there. I hadn't properly thought about this. I knew that the imperfect rough surfaces on the side were going to be challenging, but I had a pretty decent plan for it. I was thinking of building tall stone walls with torches on the backside to light these spots up. But now that I've started construction on the mountain overhead, it seems we need to start building those right away, or I'll surely have creepers falling on my head. So I got to work building up the wall and putting torches behind it. This seemed to fix my issue, as we weren't seeing any mobs behind the wall. But it was a pretty slow process. Until someone in my chat offered up the perfect suggestion. What if we used falling lava to cast the walls in place? If flowing lava gets touched by water, it will turn into cobblestone. This lava casting, as people call it, is often used to grief houses on SMPs. But in this case, it could actually save us tens of thousands of blocks that needed to be mined and then placed back. I just have to figure out how to do this cleanly, and that took some trial and error, but I think I got it. Three blocks of lava with a gap in between allows me to tower up in between the cobblestone walls while placing torches on the backside. That means I cut down the amount of blocks that I need to place by 75%. Digging a one block wide hole at the bottom where the lava is going to fall prevents it from spreading everywhere and creating a huge mess. Now, Everything on a scale this massive just looks super cool, and honestly, we could use the lava as light sources. If it wasn't for the extra lag, it would add to the base. Since leaving that wasn't a real option, I poured the water anyway, so we ended up with a cobblestone wall all the way around. This was the smoothest operation ever, it was crazy. Except for when I changed my elytra for my chest plate on muscle memory midair while reading chat. That wasn't pretty. When the walls were casted, I decided that it was probably time to convert the general mob farm to a dedicated creeper and spider farm. The bones could still be pretty useful, but I really didn't need any more rotten flesh at this point. Luckily, changing the farm was really easy. The only thing we need to do to stop this farm spawning skeletons and zombies is add trapdoors to the bottom of the spawning platforms. The thing this does is it reduces the available height to a little less than the two blocks that it was, which means there's now only enough room left for the slightly shorter creepers and the, well, very flat spiders. With that fixed, all the farms that we need right now are working, so we're free to continue working on the mountain. It is time to start making some real progress. As fast as I could, I started placing snow blocks, but every time night came around, the segments that I had just built started filling up with mobs again. To prevent creepers from blowing up the mountain while I was placing snow, I started working on the more vertical sections during the nights. This strategy worked for about a day, until mob spawning started to get insane again. 
I really have to keep up with this bomb proofing, but it's hard to keep track. I need a second color of wool for markers. Right now, we have only marked the areas that are done, but I need to be able to see which areas I'm gonna work on next as well. So I quickly built up a flower farm for dye, which gets me blue orchids because we're in a swamp biome. And these are actually my favorite small flowers in the game. And if you convert them to dye, you end up with light blue. So use that to color the wool, which I got from the sheep farm this time. The light blue segments are the areas of the mountain that I have to spawn proof next. With that, I had a lot of structure through the project all of a sudden. The mountain was starting to fill in and I was making a lot of progress. But something still felt off. I just couldn't quite pinpoint what it was. When I figured it out later, that insight honestly changed everything. Let me tell you a quick story. In my previous hardcore world, we had celebrated many milestones with different fireworks setups around the world. Looking ahead to a thousand days in this new world, I realized that the mountain base wouldn't be ready for the first big milestone here. So that meant there was only one spot where the fireworks setup would make sense. I had to build a firework system in my starter house. But if you remember, that starter house is quite special and it doesn't have a lot of space. To have enough space to build at all, I cleared out the inside. But in most places, I literally left a single layer of stone from the original rock. After decorating the insides, there isn't a lot of room to build a firework setup at all. Now, when I started the world, I said that one of my main goals for this series was to get better at redstone. So this moment presented an awesome challenge. This was an opportunity to fit in a compact redstone system, which is something that I had never been able to do yet. I walked around that basement a bunch to figure out how we were going to make this work. And then I realized the basement offered just enough space for a simple hopper clock and a lever to start it. But there was no room anywhere to carry a signal up to the top floor. Until I remembered what my friend Crafty Masterman told me about leaves being able to carry a red sun signal. You see, leaves have an invisible value that registered how far away they are from a piece of wood. Observers are able to see a change in that value, even if we as players can't. Which means we can use the leaves on the outside of my house to carry the signal up. Sure enough, the fireworks turned out awesome. I looked at it and smiled. But as that smile started to fade, it made me realize something very important. I was not having a good time over at the mountain. It is going to take us so long before the mountain base is going to have that same exciting feeling as the starter house. And I don't want to have a world that feels so empty and soulless for so long. So I decided that the spawn proofing had to wait for a little bit. I just wanted to get rid of that ridiculous hole of destruction in the middle of my world. The mountain needs to cover that hole we made earlier and everything else can wait. Now there is one thing that would speed up that process by quite a lot. Something that would make it a lot less tedious. I realized that I had to get swift sneak from the deep dark. I really didn't want to do this. This place was very scary to me right now. But we had no choice. I had to go look for an ancient city. But I was not going to go in ill-prepared. I was taking this very seriously. The thing is, losing my old world still feels pretty raw. And I still really hate that I messed up in such a dumb way. There were still so many plans that I will never get to finish. But at the same time, that world as a whole feels like a very positive experience. And in a way, I'm okay with it being gone. But losing this world right now, I imagine would feel way worse. Because I feel like the world is empty. Besides my starter house, there wouldn't be a lot to fondly look back on. Just a bunch of lost potential. So this trip to the deep dark cannot be the end of this world. As I sorted out my inventory, I took all the totems of undying that I had and I collected both of my enchanted golden apples. With all of this stuff, I was as ready as I was going to get right now. So I took off and flew away from my home. The ancient city spawned under mountain biomes, so I started looking under every tall mountain I could find. Luckily, there are a lot of them in this area, but I'm not entirely sure how rare the ancient cities are. One mountain at a time, I dug down and explored the cave systems I found. With red wool, I marked every mountain that wasn't it, and unfortunately, the first stream saw us place a lot of wool, but I didn't find the city. The next day though, I had better luck. I found myself in a cave system that consisted of parts of Dripstone Cave interlaced with huge skulk veins. As I explored it, I came across a mine shaft, which led nowhere. So I made my way back to the dripstone area, where I found a tunnel 
leading down into an ancient city. I could feel the nerves rising up. I hadn't done a lot of studying to get ready for this, but I figured that if I approached it slowly and carefully, I should be fine. But I would be lying if I said that I wasn't a little worried. So I took my sweet time to organize my inventory and grab every totem of undying that I owned, plus plenty of wool. Slowly, I started making my way down towards the city, placing torches as I went. It did not help my nerves that even something as tiny as placing down a torch can activate the sensors. I was going to have to be really careful. So before getting rid of the first shrieker, I took a couple seconds to make sure there wasn't another one nearby that would pick up the noise. So far so good. Standing up on that ledge, I took a moment to consider my approach. Some people in chat were telling me to fight a warden, but for me, it wasn't even on the table. If a warden were to spawn in, I would fly out of here as quickly as I could with no hesitation. I don't think anybody watching the stream really understood how much was at stake for me. This wasn't just about the potential of losing my progress. It was about losing what I felt was the most special hardcore world I will ever have. Sure enough, the other one was really long and we had some cool builds. But this one, it just feels different. This whole adventure of getting stuck in the end, being ready to give up and then still making my way out against all odds, it had changed everything for me. And we weren't going to lose it here. I mined down the Skulk Shrieker, so I bridged around with wool and got closer to the first chest. If this wasn't the first chest, I'm sure it would have been a disappointment. But even just finding some Skulk blocks felt really cool. Still, this wasn't what I was looking for. All I really want is a Swift Sneak 3 book. With that, I'll fly out of here as quickly as I can. The next chest didn't have anything special either. But at this point, I started noticing there was a lot of wool that naturally generated in the city. So I was able to get around a bit faster. In the next chest, I found an absolutely ridiculous hole, but I realized that I didn't need it, so I left it there. Normally, I'm sure I would have taken this as a collectible, but right now, I wasn't thinking about anything outside of not spawning a warden and getting what I came for before running into trouble. Carefully, I kept making my way around, and I found the next chest, but this one had nothing useful except for disc fragments. After that, I had run out of wool. So I flew up and reorganized my inventory to get more blocks. Even just flying around with your elytra can activate the sensors and shriekers, so I carefully made my way back down as I approached the next chest. Nothing either. At this point, I started to get worried. I really wasn't looking to explore a ton of ancient cities just to find a book. This was stressing me out. Even though I was feeling anxious, I was also getting a bit more comfortable with the environment which led to my first mistake. That was the first shriek, and I didn't even get to open the chest yet. Carefully, I made my way back and I tried again. But even with a wall of wool in front of it, the sensor still heard it, and it carried the signal to the shrieker on the other side of the wall. We were now on two strikes, and I wasn't entirely sure whether the next one would summon a warden, or if we had one more chance left. Here, we could easily reach the exit of the cave, but I still needed a book. So I slowly made my way back down there and I kept exploring. But I was more careful and made sure I spotted every shrieker and sensor before I accidentally stepped on one again. The next chest I found, I made sure to fully seal it in with a wool before opening it up. I checked the way out of the cave in case I wanted to fly. And once I had the entire escape plan figured out, I opened up the chest. And there it was. I somehow wasn't expecting it here. But there was the book I had come down here to risk everything for. It had been over 10 minutes since the shrieker had gone off twice, so I checked a few more chests and I even found a second book. But no enchanted golden apples, unfortunately. With the loot I was hoping to get, I left the ancient city, but before leaving the mountain itself behind, I made a giant red arrow pointing down at the drop chute leading into the city, just in case I wanted to find my way back here later. As I flew back towards the mountain base, I slowly calmed down. I had been down in that ancient city for almost an hour that's how slow I took it, and I had been tense the entire time. On my way back to the house, I felt like we had just found the most important thing that came with the 1.19 update. And in a way I was right of course, but it wasn't the most important thing for us. This may have been the most tricky thing to find, but we were about to find something else that would have a much more profound impact. But it'd be a little while before we got to that. With the mountain in sight, I turned left to the house and put the swift sneak enchantment on my netherite leggings. Placing blocks was crazy fast now compared to before. 
I was always crouching while doing this to prevent falling off the edge, which meant I moved around awfully slowly. Not anymore though, Swift Sneak is insane. It is almost as fast as sprinting. That's honestly crazy, and it made such a difference in how quickly we placed the blocks. Now that progress was so quick, I ran out of snow blocks in no time at all. So it was back at the snow farm, breaking more shovels, back at the mountain, placing more snow, which once again ran out before I knew it. So I made another trip to the farm. Progress was really speeding up now. But even though we were flying through the progress, I still felt like something was off. There was still that nagging feeling that something was missing. I honestly had no idea what it could be. And then, someone in my stream chat suggested we go and check out the new mangrove swamp. So I set off and I flew around the world. Now I'm not sure whether it was because I had kept my world small and hadn't explored many chunks, or I simply got lucky, but we found it pretty quickly. And the timing was honestly really remarkable. I'm not sure if what happened that day was just lucky timing or something else, but things fell in place in a magical way. Let's take a step back as we watch this part of the story unfold together. Do you see Looney flying over there? He's been through some things lately. Life isn't always smooth sailing, and over the last little while, he has caught some waves. They shook him up a little bit, rocked him back and forth, made things a little more complicated than he would have liked them to be. But the rocky road hasn't made him back down. It hasn't made him cry in a quarter and give up. He's been working, moving forward, even if the current went against him. But he's about to learn that he's forgotten some of the most important things that he's learned over the last couple of years. I think that's pretty natural. I guess it happens to all of us every now and again. Luckily, this is not a sad story. Looney is about to come out of this forest with an insight that he needed to find and he found it at the perfect moment. As night set over the mangrove, he marveled at the beautiful trees and he knew exactly what he had lost. He knew exactly what he was missing. In the old world, Looney had met an unfortunate end before he got to complete his biggest vision. He wanted to leave a world behind that was connected. He had meant for the heart of the sea and Looneyville to be woven together by a magical underwater pathway. In the end, he got quite far for a first try, but he died in a world that was unfinished and the world died with him before he could connect it up like he had wanted to. As he walked around the forest and looked at the lights and their reflections, listened to the sounds of the mangrove and their echoes coming back from unexpected angles, the forest felt like he was breathing and swirling around him and he could feel something changing, something important. All of a sudden, he felt ready to leave some of that weight that he'd been carrying behind. That night, it was as if he shed his skin and left the mistakes of the past behind him. Season 1 Looney had died a little while ago, but it wasn't until now that Season 2 Looney was born. As the sun rose in the morning, he flew out of there feeling lighter, feeling refreshed and looking ready to write a story worth listening to. I knew what I had to do, and curiously enough, it happened on the day that I had changed my Minecraft skin. It wasn't the mountain that had bothered me at all. It was the feeling of an empty world with disconnected projects. In my season one world, there were so many cool things wherever I went. In this world, the snow farm is the coolest built besides the starter house. To fix my world and get excited again, I need to make sure everything is connected. I had done some minor decoration a little while ago when I made the storage tower and two crop fields next to the mountain. But the area still felt empty and incoherent, so we needed something more. I took my elytra and flew to this small building that's called the Pathfinder's Lodge. I will tell you about this place later, because it is actually really important. But for now, this is just where I started building a series of roads called the Mangrove Trail. I connected the starter base to this small map room, to the storage tower, to the mountain, to the crop fields, and then, when I flew up in the air, I realized there was one more spot left to build to fill in the area and make it feel like a world rather than a project. This forest over here is an empty spot between everything I've built so far, so this is the best place for a Hall of Fame. I quickly mined out the space under the build, figured out what type of blocks I wanted to use and flew out to a Badlands biome to collect terracotta. Before flying out of there, I restored the area to keep the biome pretty. Now I had the terracotta I needed, but I was missing some other important resources, for which I still had to set up farms. But that wasn't as simple as it had been before. 
At this point, the farms were getting more advanced, which meant that I needed some information, which is really quite hard to find without using F3. So before we get to the farms, we have to backtrack a little while. Actually, we need to go back quite far, to a moment right before I started building the snow farm. You see, before I had started the world and committed to not using F3, I had taken my time to do some research on the limitations it would impose. And it turns out, one of the trickiest things to do without coordinates is linking up nether portals. If you don't really care about the coordinate puzzle, you can skip to the next chapter and I'll have a surprise gold farm for you. But if you want to know everything, listen up. You probably know how the nether can be used to travel great distances in the overworld, right? Because one block in the nether equates to eight blocks in the overworld. So to make sure that a portal between the dimensions links up to the portal you want it to connect to, you take the overworld coordinates, divide those by 8, and then you have the nether portal coordinates. Well, that's all pretty simple, as long as you can see those coordinates on your screen. Without that option, you need to start using reference points. And that all starts with the only reference point you can find in every world. The block with the coordinates, negative 64, negative 64. Well, and from there, zero, zero, of course, which makes a lot more sense. Let me explain. In Minecraft, there are five sizes of maps that you can use. These cover 128, 256, 512, 1024, and 2048 blocks, which actually makes a lot of sense if you know how bits work. And I'm not talking Doritos or Twitch kind here. Anyway, your world spawn is always within 2048 blocks from zero, zero, and usually it's a lot closer than that. If you make a level 4 map, the biggest one, it will tell you where you are in relation to world spawn. If you're in the top left corner of your large map, you're on the right map and you're actually really close. If you're in any other corner, you will need to walk or fly off the map towards the map where you would be on the top left corner. Once you find yourself on the right map, you make a new small map and use it. This map has negative 64 and negative 64 as the top left corner. The bottom right is 6464, and as you might have figured out, the middle of the map is on 0, 0. It's like that in every single world. From this point, you can start using maps to count distances from the corner of that first map. That technique eventually led me to dislocation, which is negative 1088, negative 2114, or at least I think so. To mark this location forever, I put a small building down that I called the Pathfinder's Lodge, which is going to be my reference point for connecting portals in this area. Now I just need to repeat the process in the nether to be able to set up a portal-based gold farm. Maps don't work very well in the nether, but they will still do everything you need them to do in order to count and navigate with them. The terrain in the nether can be really challenging if you're trying to figure out your maps. Luckily, I needed to be on the nether roof anyway to make the gold farm work, so I did the thing I had to do, and I glitched my way through the nether ceiling using an ender pearl aimed at the highest block of bedrock. An extremely reliable trick that always freaks me out in hardcore. From there, I made my way back down through the bedrock, and I set up a nether portal which connected to a portal up on a tree in the swamp. So far, so good. The next step wasn't so lucky. I accidentally set up what should be the gold farm in a warped forest biome, which wasn't going to work at all. So instead, I rebuilt it some 40 blocks over. While I built up the farm, I figured out the plan to connect this to the right overworld portal. To do that, I had to find 0, zero in the nether using the same technique and then measure the distance from there to the center of the farm using block lines. From there, we could multiply by 8 and we'd know the overworld coordinates. Tricky, but doable. So I got to work. Eventually, I started marking segments of 64 diagonal blocks in the nether from 0, zero. Then I placed blocks to measure the distance from those 64 cans because I knew that the 64 cans had to be map corners. From there, I found the coordinates that we needed to go to. Then we multiplied those by eight, found the right coordinates in the overworld and counted out that number from the Pathfinder's Lodge. It was honestly an anxious moment to try to farm for the first time. But sure enough, it actually worked, which felt like a major victory because from here we could organize nether portals all around the base later. We had a working reference system going out from negative 1088, negative 2114, right outside of the mountain. Or any other number that we thought to be negative 1088, negative 2114. Anyway, it doesn't really matter if we're right or wrong here, because we're going to use this block as our reference number and these portals did link up. So even if we're wrong, anytime we use this as our reference, we're going to calculate with the same mistake, making it irrelevant. 
So now that we had the portals linked up successfully, we were done with Minecraft rocket science for the time being, and the next step was an easier one. Some farms work best if you build them inside of a single chunk, because it prevents their redstone from breaking when you fly out of the area. Well, we are not going to look at chunk borders either, but those align with map edges. So we laid out a reference grid on the bottom of the mountain, and with that, we were ready to set up the other farms. Long story short, working gold farm with links up portals, very awesome. With all of the preparation we had just done, I could now also add an automated wood farm designed by Raceworks, which is honestly too complicated and intricate to explain fully, but I'll leave a link to his video in the description. The concept is really cool though. This farm uses bone meal to grow azalea saplings on moss blocks, then it grows these saplings into a tree and drops TNT when a tree grows. To provide this farm with bone meal, I added another moss-based farm that generates a ton of bone meal by turning the output from two stone generators into moss. This farm fuels itself and the extra output will keep the tree farm running. This one is made by Il Mango and also has a link in the description. Finally, I needed a simple cactus farm for green dye. These are really easy to make because cactus breaks itself if it grows next to a block. See? Easy as that. All of these new additions and iron not being an issue anymore, we could make all the hoppers needed and slowly but surely the industrial backbone of our base was taking shape. I had the things I needed, so it was time to finish up the Hall of Fame. This build was actually a race against the clock, as I tried to get it finished up before day 1000. Our story for today isn't quite over yet though, because now that the Hall of Fame is done, I can see my vision coming together. The world looks and feels way more connected. But it's one-way traffic. The world is connected to the mountain now, but we still need to connect the mountain to the world around it. Because, let's be real, it looks incredibly out of place right now. Before we get around to fixing that, let's take a moment to celebrate the official 1000 days marker. Because, honestly, it is quite the achievement. Let's activate the fireworks show I prepared for this moment. While you enjoy that, you might actually be wondering, how do I know it's day 1000 without pressing F3? Well, normally I calculate the days by taking the time played and multiplying the real life days by 72. Three game days per hour without sleeping and 24 hours in a day. But just for the occasion, I will show it in my replay mode file as well. All right, let's go finish up this mountain project for now. There were just two steps left to do before I could start working on my main base. Full of excitement, I flew to the snow farm to get all the resources needed for the next stage of the build. The last step is a truly magical one. But before we get to that, I need to make sure this mountain becomes spawn-proof. These marked off sections with the wool are actually working really well. That is, until I got up to the higher parts, where I soon realized that this was an impossible job. If I can help it, I prefer to come up with creative solutions to keep track in the game. But on this one, I had to concede my loss. So I needed an extra creative solution. This wasn't the most straightforward thing in the world, but luckily, I found a texture pack for overlapping snow layers. You see, the side and top of snow blocks and layers share the same texture, so you can't just recolor the side or top easily. That would involve messing with the block data, and I wasn't going to do that. So instead, I made the entire snow texture red, except for the overlapping textures this pack added, which looked absolutely awful. But it does allow us to find the spots where I still need to add layers. Slowly but surely, over many hours of work, I started getting closer to finishing the layers. This alone must have taken me over 40 hours. And we actually got very close to losing all of that progress at one point. An attachment to my old world had put this new adventure at risk. You see, in my old world, I had built a place that was called the Mob Head Museum. Located under my main base, the heart of the sea, there was a place filled with memories. I had stored all the music discs, the dragon egg, 69 enchanted golden apples, an axolotl tank, art installations, and many more things in there. The museum was built to house my mob head collection though. By the time I lost the world, I had collected a total of 2,286 heads in there, without any type of farm. It was one of my proudest achievements. So in this new world, I wanted to start a new collection. But the early attempts had led to a lot of destruction. At some point, I came up with a smart idea. You see, creepers can't destroy waterlogged slabs. Whether they're charged or not, the water blocks their explosion. Since I spent a ton of time over at the mountain, and I didn't want to move away from the project whenever there was a thunderstorm, I decided to put a waterlogged platform on the top while we were building up the mountain around it. 
That resulted in a fair amount of mob heads during the rare thunderstorms. But in the end, it inevitably went wrong. By a fault that wasn't my own, a skeleton shot a creeper, causing it to blow up and take a huge chunk out of the side of the mountain. By the time I realized what had happened, the water had already tumbled down the mountainside in a giant wave that washed out thousands of snow layers. Now, I had been aware of this danger, but I decided to risk it anyway. And the price I paid for it was about two hours of my time, as I had become really quick at placing the layers. But it was a fair amount of extra work nonetheless. Eventually, we got it done though. And then, it was finally time to do something I had been looking forward to for a while. While we were building up the mangrove trail, the crop fields, the hall of fame, and all the bridges and tunnels in between, we had been connecting the world to the mountain. Now it was time to connect the mountain to the world around it. I had already covered the treetops in snow and added ice to the water around the mountain without any remarkable incidents. Covering the rest of the biome around this place in snow sounds simple, but it's actually quite the operation and I wasn't ready to pull this off by myself. So once more, I made my way to the snow farm to bring my good friend Chatterson Jr. the 8th in for help. The 8th? Um, yeah, Creeper and Estrella, I'm, I'm sorry guys. Anyway, this guy will be able to help. Remember how snowmen leave snow layers on the ground? That's how the snow farm works, right? Now, this does not work for spawn proofing, because a single layer won't stop mobs from spawning, but it does work if you want to cover your world in snow. Actually, it works quite well. So I started skating towards the swamp from the snow farm, but then night came around. Definitely nothing went wrong here, so we're going to quickly skip a minute or two where I'm getting a bunch more snowmen ready to cover the swamp in snow. To spawn in snowmen, you need carved pumpkins. So I got to work preparing for the spooky season and carved a bunch of pumpkins using a pair of shears. Once I summoned the snowmen, they immediately started running around like headless chickens while I used the shears to remove their pumpkins. Surely this chaos wasn't indicative of what was about to happen next. It couldn't be. So me and my goofy snowy friends made our way over to the swamp and as I dragged them around, they left snow layers all over the place. I would highly recommend you try this for some area in your world. It's honestly so much fun. Unfortunately, we did run into some issues along the way. It turns out these guys are not waterproof. If they fall in a water block, they melt. So we lost this guy by no fault of my own, right? Well, I won't let a small setback keep me down and these guys are just as unstoppable. So we kept going and the look of the swamp started changing under our eyes. The thing is, I hate to say it, but me and the snowman, we don't have a very good track record together. As when I sat over the swamp, well, let's say the track record wasn't going to improve from here. The first creeper that showed up wasn't able to come close, but this incident had me worried. So I came up with a plan. I talked to all the chatter say and tell, and told them to hold on tight. Then I activated my elytra and took off. But apparently only three of the snowmen had listened, as the rest of them slipped off the rope immediately. What unfolded down below was a bloody battle. I tried to come back and save them, but the harm was already done. Now, I wish that was the worst of it. But the real horror hadn't even started yet. With the first drops of rain, an entire generation of snowmen was wiped out. That was the first day and night of coloring in the swamp. In the first world, the total snowman death toll was four. When the mountain was done, well, that number had risen by a lot. But hey, in the end, we got the job done. That's all that counts, right? Well, no, not even close. I decided that I had to make up for the turmoil I had caused for generations of snowmen. So the least I could do is provide some sort of restitution for their suffering. We all carry the traces of our lineage. And much like my distant ancestors, I had sailed off to lands unknown to burn a place that didn't belong to me, along with the people that had lived there for generations, only to claim it as my own. For all my good intentions, I had ruined the lives of generations of snowmen in my own vain quest for glory. A wrong that can never be made right. But that doesn't mean I shouldn't try. Knowing full well that I could never make it right 
I tried that one small thing I could imagine doing. I decorated the inside of the snow farm with a beautiful interior so King Cheddarson the 21st and the next generation of snowmen could happily live in their castle free of outside rule or exploitation. If I ever need snow in the future, I hope they will want to help me out and I'll propose a fair trade to add to their kingdom in exchange. I would be more than happy if they even welcome me. There's a lesson here, guys. Dreams, aspirations, ambition, glory, or whatever you desire should never come at the expense of others. In reality, the world is a messy place because historically it almost always has, and a lot of the time it still does. Even if you didn't cause any of that, it won't hurt you to acknowledge things that are now in the past. And I swear to God, if anybody ever comments the Dutch word for colonized on a video again, I'll hide your account faster than you can like this video. After all that madness, the mountain was ready and it was now a part of the world around it. This place is ready for me to start building my base. The wildest base that I will ever build in survival Minecraft. I have no doubt in my mind. As I looked around, I realized how much I love this world already. My world. A connected world that feels awesome to spend time in. A world that I have built from scratch. A world which had been lost to a glitch. But somehow, against all odds, we had managed to recover it together by breaking free of our broken end dimension. Do you know what the crazy part is? Let me tell you something wild. And while you listen, if you could quickly subscribe to the channel, it would help me out a lot. It is free and you can always take it back. Over these past thousand days, the world wasn't the only thing that was recovered. Getting back the things we lost when I died in season one wasn't easy. I had to go through so many problems with this new world that I had slowly taken care of in the old world over the course of two years. But as this story started to come together, I began to remember some really important things that I figured out earlier and accidentally lost sight of. I've never done a more challenging grind than this one. And I'm not just talking about Minecraft here. As we recover this world and build up a new journey out of nothing, we claim back something much bigger than just a Minecraft world. Over this first leg of our new journey, I had to gain back my confidence as a player, a storyteller, a creator, and as a person. I had to discover who Looney was going to be going forward. And that was a scary, intense process with many long nights, sacrifices, and unseen hours of work. Something I only managed to pull off with the help of the people who were there to support me through that process. And of course, the people who watched me do it. Thank you for everything guys, and I hope to see you soon on stream or in another thousand days as we are about to enter what I think the mid game is. I will see you soon. For now, Looney.